aim of the presentation is to talk about this emerging research framework, um, mainly focusing on doing visitor research, and it's emerging from different fields, so I'm not going to just use material coming on, from archaeology, because frankly there isn't much as far as user research is concerned. And I'm going to, um, the presentation is going to echo a lot of the points that previous uh, presenters made, um, and also some of the questions that were asked. And Paul is going to disagree with some as well, um, as it should, hopefully. I'm going to put things in a wider um, context, and um, as I do that, I'm going to start by explaining why digital is in parentheses there. So there are three main reasons why, and two have to do with users or participants. We don't have one term to actually describe the people that take part in um, public engagement activities. Um, and it's a combination, so people use a combination of engagement modes. And um, the people, even those who tend to use more digital resources, we all inhabit a physical world. So it doesn't, it's not just about digital resources. Those resources are used within a physical context. And that merging of the two has been facilitated and actually accelerated through um, what we call now ubiquitous computing or embedded technologies. So what I'm going to propose to you is that digital archaeology or the engagement with digitally rich, with um, archaeology rich resources, is just one of the many resources that people use. And you have to look at it from people's point of view. Um, people don't live in museums, they transit through them, they do lots of things in their everyday lives. One of them might be, at some point, visiting an archaeological site, using books or digital resources related to archaeology, but then they do other, many, many other things. So we're looking at the continuum rather than either you use digital or analog resources. So let's see um, how that kind of merging happened. Up to about 10 years ago, um, there wasn't, so there was a um, physical world and you had resources like objects, places, people, and their representations, and they only existed in the physical world. And then you had digital resources, which could be um, information about objects, and location information, maps, uh, personal information through the traces we leave, for example, when you buy things online or when you tweet, um, use Facebook and so on. But now these technologies are merging and they're merging mainly because we use um, smartphones, most of us. Actually, a very recent um, research, research conducted <coughs> collaboratively by the American Association of Museums and the Museum Association shows that nearly half of the population living in North America and Western Europe has smartphones. Now, this is a staggering number and it's getting more and more. And that actually creates what we call now big data. So we're at the point that big data is on us and nobody actually has the skill to use it and mine it. So let me give you some examples um, from studies I've done. This is um, an 11-year-old pupil using a mobile phone which is administered by OCO uh, at the National Maritime Museum. And what she can do <coughs> is collect um, photographs, use it at specific points in the exhibition to um, find out more information using QR codes. Um, she can record messages, she can text people, and all of that information goes on the website that then is available to be used at school. 
And that interaction at school also involves asking curator and other members of staff from the Maritime Museum questions. So there's a lot more interaction going on and a lot of content that is created by the cupids, which could be seen as heritage or archaeology rich resources. Another study from um, the London Zoo. This, we used, um, I collaborated with people from Birkbeck, the um, computer science department, to, um, you, to combine more traditional visitor studies um, methodologies with um, trails that people leave behind when they use mobile phones. The mobile phones were given to them. And um, so based on that, we were able to look at those trails that people left as they went about the visit and compare them with elements of their expectations, the motivations, why they were in the space in the first place, and see those groupings um, that occur naturally as you analyze the data, how it compares to actual, actual physical behaviors within the space and what you can tell about um, so these are some of the projects that are already happening, and those projects actually happened um, three or four years back. And with these kind of technologies, by the time you describe the technology, it's already obsolete. So we're, we're talking about really fast-moving technologies. So to go back to the point I made earlier about the continuum of um, resources, and it's not just about digital or physical. And we're talking about the same people using those resources. Um, <coughs> what it seems to me that we need um, is to better understand the diversity of options that people have and the different levels of engagement so that we make more um, informed decisions about which models are more appropriate for different institutions <coughs> or different resources within the same institution, and also at different times and for different audiences. Um, so, I'm going to um, propose two main uh, frameworks that come from uh, public understanding of science. And um, I've also added the Einstein's ladder of citizen participation because um, although it's quite old now, you'd be surprised how many of those models are underpinned by um, this work. And what Einstein tried to do was to actually demonstrate the power relationships that exist when people participate in order to make decisions. So. Um, with the first one, the Science for All expert group, the, this group was commissioned by the UK government to look at the relationship between science and society. And they also did a mapping exercise looking at the different approaches to public engagement with science. And um, it, that was back in 2010. Um, a UK, a US based group. Um, the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education, or CASE, the inquiry group. This is funded by NSF money, um, National Science Foundation in the US. And um, they, to my view, they moved those frameworks a step forward and I'll explain why. So the first framework coming from um, the UK, um, Again, as I said before, it's based on a scoping exercise, so um, projects were actually um, uh, looked at. And um, this is a framework that has been adopted by UCL's public engagement unit as well. So with necessary adaptments, it, it can be used in different contexts. So please look beyond the content or discipline. So we have different modes of public engagement, ranging from telling to consulting. The first two are um, telling and sharing, are institution-led. 
the aim of the first one is to promote a particular point of view and actually convince people of the value of that particular point of view. The, the second one um, assumes a kind of knowledge deficit um, in, in the users. So if only people had more information, they would surely make the right decisions, and that is the decisions we want them to make. Um, then involving, um, actually, you have people engaged from the very start, from the conception stage through to the running of the activity, evaluating it, and taking um, charge of that. So the aim is to actually involve people in order to improve the quality and also the impact that the activities have. And the last one um, is more based on dialogue and deliberation that um, good decision making in mature democracies at least should be a process of deliberation and different points of view coming together. So the aim here is to improve the quality of the decisions that are made. Now, with this framework and any kind of those frameworks, the um, assumption is that there's something better. And the better thing is consulting. Because, of course, we want people to live in a democratic society. But what we actually um, know from other work that has been done, um, looking at the case example, is that things are much more actually uh, complex than that. And you'll find that and it's something that um, the previous group also recognized that even within the same community, say scientists doing maths, mm -hmm. they have um, ideas that are closer to telling and also ideas that may be closer to consulting and anything in between. So um, things are much fuzzier in real life. And how do we account for that? And how do we develop theory that reflects on what actually happens on the ground? So uh, this um, group looked at, uh, again, different, thank you, different uh, projects. And they um, identified dimensions, different dimensions, and also milestones within those three dimensions. And what I think is really, um, interesting about this one is that they didn't just look at the publics but also at scientists as the public and the fact that some of the activities could be targeted um, towards specialists and the public could be specialists who may know nothing about mathematician may know nothing about you know a particular area in physics so they may be as um, ignorant as anybody else so it raises the question, who is the public of uh, public engagement activities? And, and so within this um, research framework I'd like to propose, um, some key questions that need to be addressed is what are the goals for public engagement activities for the different publics? And the goals come both from the institution, and you cannot ignore that, but also people have motivations. We don't know enough about why people engage in the first place. What do they get out of it? How it relates to other things they do in their social life? Why, why do they care? And also we need to have a more nuanced understanding of what these publics are. It's appropriate as part of the public understanding of science, but when you're studying people, you need to, do, to look at people. Um, we also don't know enough about the different elements of public engagement activities that can lead to good quality engagement. That's where I would disagree about um, good practice or best practice. I think it needs to be seen in the context of people's lives. There isn't just, you know, in, in, um, it's kind of arbitrary. Then it's, you have to look at, at some kind of context. There's no best practice there. Um, we also need to look at the different spaces and their affordances. What kind of actions and interactions different types of environments afford? Um, what kind of um, behaviors you can observe? 
And how can we tweak environments or create environments that create different types of engagement and responses? We cannot change people. Everybody who is in relationship knows that. What we can do <laughs> is change environments, and that's where we can intervene. And then again, go back to my original message that we have to look at engagement activities across the spectrum. And um, finally, so how does that um, take us forward? This echoes a lot of the points that people made earlier, that you know, this is a huge undertaking. We don't even, um, haven't even scratched the surface. We don't know what, how to even approach big data and what kind of analytics that involves. So it needs to be collaborative. It, there's no other uh, way. And it needs to be multidisciplinary as well. We need other people to ask um, questions and make the questions we ask in research better and more um, also cover things that we don't we haven't even started asking yet because there are gaps in um, certain disciplines, gaps in, in knowledge and understanding. It needs to be theory driven and more importantly it needs to create theory that describes the practice, what happens out there rather than what we would like to happen. Now in the world that I inhabit research-wise, um, because I do um, research looking at learning in museums but learning as a cultural process. Um, there's a lot of work coming from sociocultural learning theories and also using a um, ecological framework that can bring different, actually, different ideas together, different people together. Um, it goes beyond um, constructivism, which is absolutely fine, but it still, it still looks at learning through um, a psychological lens. We're still looking at one person, even with social constructivism, it's kind of quite um, within that um, constraint. Um, I often find that people do research or evaluation, and it's something that they do after the activity has ended. And there's so much out there. People leave behind, they leave their diaries, they collect things, their things on um, Twitter and here and there. You can look at those resources from a research point of view. You don't need necessarily to create um, an interview protocol. <coughs> and more importantly, they can be embedded in the actual technology. So for example, going back to the example at the zoo, you have mobile phones. And whether you want it or not, they just track you. Wherever you go, this data is, um, is there to, to be used. So um, you can actually use that. You can use tweets, you can use Facebook interactions, and so on. And what that does, it gives you access to kind of data that has never, ever been available before. It, it can give us insights into behaviors that it wasn't just possible to study um, up to 10 years ago. And it can look at change of behaviors over a long period of time, which again, um, we were not really good at doing that, um, partly because of the way the funding works. And also going back to a question asked earlier about how do we access all of that? Our community hasn't been very good at doing that. It's very fragmented, the picture. You have some journals, but you really, practitioners don't have access to those to start with and there isn't just a repository something like a knowledge base where people can go and think about how do I design environments what does research tell me about that and I would encourage you to look at two again um, there's a lot of science related material but if you look beyond the content and I'm not suggesting that there are outcomes and processes and concepts that are discipline specific, but there are quite a few that cut across disciplines. So um, the case website and also exhibit files has a lot of resources that can be used by people from different disciplines. Okay, that's my last slide, thank you. Thank you.